Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining. I want to welcome you all to a special summer edition of the Sustainable Futures Speaker Series at Humboldt State. Um, this is a, a lecture series that dates back to 2005, and since then, these uh, lectures have stimulated collaboration and conversations around issues related to energy, the environment, and society. Uh, all lectures are free and open to the public, and they are sponsored by the Schatz Energy Research Center, the Environment and Community Graduate Program in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at Humboldt State University. And for uh, information about upcoming events, uh, you can go to schatzcenter.org slash events, which is the uh, uh, web address that's shown uh, there on your screen. Um, uh, my name is Arnie Jacobson. I'm director of the Schatz Energy Research Center um, our work focuses on uh, research and demonstration projects and related activities associated with um, clean and renewable energy. Uh, we have a strong uh, climate mitigation and climate resilience uh, dimension to our work. Uh, and so um, we are uh, thrilled to, um, that our, our community is, is in a position to host uh, and, and welcome um, uh, um, uh, crew and researchers associated with Nathaniel B. Palmer, um, which is, uh, is currently docked um, here in Eureka. Uh, maybe advance to the next slide, Maya. Um, and um, uh, um, from my perspective, there are, there are many ways to be a hero in our society right now. And, Conducting climate research or engaging or supporting climate research, I think, is one of those ways. And um, uh, really welcome the work that, um, that the uh, US Arctic program is doing and everyone associated with it. And, uh, and so really happy to be in a position to host this session uh, here today. Uh, and uh, to be able to welcome uh, people associated with that, uh, that endeavor to, to our community. Um, whether uh, in person or, or engaging with us uh, remotely. Uh, just a few words of housekeeping. Um, we'll have a, after the series of presentations, we'll have a Q&A session uh, at the end. Uh, please use the Q&A box to ask uh, uh, questions of the speakers. You should see a link for uh, Q&A at the bottom uh, of your screen. Um, if you have technical difficulties, please post them to the chat box. Um, and uh, we'll try and help you resolve uh, the, those issues as, as quickly as we can. Uh, Maya Kelly from the Schatz Energy Research Center and Elaine Hood from the US Arctic Program are monitoring the chat and the QA windows and uh, thanks to both of them for that. Um, please also note that live closed captioning is being provided for this talk. Uh, you can click the closed captioning uh, button which is indicated by CC. Uh, on the bottom of your screen to turn captions on uh, if you're interested to do so. And a recording of this event will be available um, uh, within a few weeks as soon as we're able to get it, uh, get it out. Um, and with that, I would like to turn things over to Andrea Tuttle, but just a, a word before doing that. Um, a Andrea is a um, member of the Schatz Energy Research Center Advisory Board and um, in addition to all of the good contributions she's made to the, to the center and to our community, she's also from our side, the instigator for this event. She uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, noted or noticed that the, that the vessel, uh, the Nathaniel P. Palmer vessel was here and she took steps to uh, uh, establish contact and uh, initiated uh, the set of conversations that led to this event. So I wanna, Give a big thanks to Andrea for uh, for making that happen. So, and with that, I'll pass it over over to you. Thanks, Arnie. Let's see. Am I on now? May I? Yes. yes. Good. Thanks. Hi, everybody, um, and welcome. Um, this is really an exciting webinar for our Humboldt students and all the broader community who are logged in, and I'm so glad you're all able to join. 
as Arnie said, this session is really the result of true serendipity on many dimensions. Um, first of all, it's only by chance that this vessel, this interesting Antarctic research vessel, is here in Humboldt Bay at all. As you will learn, uh, this is related to the COVID virus and the need to identify a major plan B for where the ship could spend the um, Antarctic winter. And second, it's only by chance and some sleuthing and the help of some knowledgeable friends that the Schatz Lab and I have been able to track down the right contacts and make the initial outreach to see if a program might be possible. So with the help of a skilled consultant for the Antarctic program, we received not only a warm welcome from the National Science Foundation, but also from the panel of excellent speakers. We feel very honored to have them spending time with us telling us about basically three major aspects of the ship and its mission. First, we'll get an overview of the US Antarctic program in general. And then we'll have a description of the ship and life on board and the coordination of the ship and the research activities while in Antarctica. And then we'll have a description uh, by one of the research scientists who has done work on the Thwaites Glacier and will tell us why this um, glacier is the subject of such intense investigation. And the, she'll tell us about the specific research questions that she's involved with. So let me briefly introduce the speakers. Um, I'll introduce all three at once and then they can pass the baton um, among themselves. So first we're honored to have uh, Tim McGovern Tim works for the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs, and specifically, he is the Ocean Projects Manager within the Antarctic Infrastructure and Logistics section. So as you might know, the motto of the National Science Foundation is where discoveries begin. So doing research in Antarctica requires close coordination between the logistics of getting the researchers and the equipment to and around the continent, and then the work of the researchers themselves. So Tim oversees the operations of the ice breaking research vessels and all the scientific activities in the Antarctic Peninsula and uh, Palmer Station. And he also helps to manage the largest contractor that supports the operation and science um, of the US Antarctic program. Next, we have Al Hickey. And Al has become an honorary Humboldt resident this summer as one of the key people now living aboard the ship while it is moored in the bay. Al is a marine project coordinator for the US Antarctic program, which means that he serves as the liaison on board between the ship's captain and the crew and the research scientists. Al is a licensed professional, professional mariner uh, with the US Coast Guard. And he's since the 1980s, he's been working closely um, on many of these research and educational vessels. And when he's not working for the US Antarctic program, he often uses his skills in logistics uh, to help with uh, Doctors Without Borders overseas. And finally, we have Dr. Julia Wellner. Dr. Wellner is an associate professor at the University of Houston, and she specializes in studying the history of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, since the Eocene. So this means that she studies the geomorphic signatures of the ice sheet as it retreats across the continental shelf, and she studies the patterns of deposition of sediments um, in fjords. So she and her team have recently returned from Antarctica, uh, where they were looking at uh, the sediments deposited in the seas near the Thwaites Glacier. Um, and she works closely with the British Antarctic Survey residents um, on the 
International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. So with that, let me thank our speakers for taking time for speaking with us about this incredibly interesting Antarctic research program. Let me turn the program over to Tim McGovern, who will take it from here. So Tim, the screen is yours. Great, thank you. Um, let me... Set that up. Okay, first, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, and can you all see the first slide I've got up? Yes. Fantastic. All right, we're in business. So, um, thank you, Andrea and Arnie and Maya, uh, and good afternoon, Humboldt University. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Tim McGovern. And I'm the Ocean Projects Manager, the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs. Um, to start, I wanted to give everyone some background on NSF and the U.S. Antarctic Program. Uh, by presidential directive, uh, NSF is tasked with managing the entire U.S. national program in Antarctica. Now, within NSF, the active management of the USAP, or the USAP, falls the Office of Polar Programs, where I work. Now, U.S. policy towards Antarctica has four fundamental objectives, protecting the environment and its associated ecosystems, preserving and pursuing unique opportunities for scientific research, maintaining Antarctica as an area of international cooperation reserved exclusively for peaceful purposes, and assuring the conservation and sustainable management of the living resources in the oceans surrounding Antarctica. As part of our presidential mandate, NSF maintains three year-round stations in Antarctica. And those include the geopolitically important South Pole Station uh, and two coastal stations, McMurdo in the Ross Sea and Palmer Station in the Antarctic Peninsula. And just to give the audience some scale of the geographic region we're talking about, here you can see the U.S. overlaid onto a map of Antarctica, showing just how big it is. The continent occupies one and a half times the size of the continental United States. The other thing that people tend not to be aware of is just how far away Antarctica truly is. Now, I like this graphic because it shows the two main supply routes for our station that stretch over 10,000 miles. NSF headquarters uh, are in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, those of our uh, current prime contractor are in Denver, Colorado. And we consolidate all of our cargo shipping uh, at Port Wainimi, California. For Palmer Station, we generally transit supplies and people through Punta Arenas, Chile in South America. Uh, and the final leg of that journey is made by ship on a four-day crossing of the Drake Passage, since there's no there's no air runway or uh, yeah there's no runway at Palmer Station. The other main route is via Christchurch, New Zealand, and it's the stopping off spot for flights to the continent, uh, to McMurdo Station, and then on to South Pole Station. Now, those legs are, are accomplished by C-17 aircraft to McMurdo and then ski-equipped LC-130 aircraft on the South Pole. And, uh, you know, a standard flight from New Zealand to McMurdo takes a minimum of five hours and then another three hours to get to Pole. Um, it gives you some sense of, of the distances involved. So annually, the U.S. Antarctic Program supports upwards of 120 science projects, moving some 3,000 people to and from the station. It is a monumental logistics challenge that for my 10 years in the USAP, I can tell you it's never the same. Each year presents new and unique challenges, and obviously this year in particular has certainly been a unique and challenging one. Given the challenges of supporting work in this remote region, we strive to support research that truly can only be done or best done in Antarctica. Still, the breadth of research conducted in Antarctica is truly remarkable, 
and it includes astronomy, earth sciences, biology and ecosystem research, as well as meteorology and atmospheric research. Some of our key scientific priorities involve exploring the origins of the universe with work done using the array of telescopes at the South Pole Station, studying Antarctic biota and how they have evolved and adapted to polar environments. Efforts like these are typically performed at either McMurdo or Palmer stations. And studying climate change, glacier movements and associated rising sea levels, work that is conducted from both our remote field camps and importantly from our research vessels. So U.S. Antarctic program research vessels play an extremely important role in studying the marine and coastal environments around Antarctica. Here you can see another image of Antarctica, um, this time with the light and green lines uh, indicating track lines our research ships have made on oceanographic voyages around the continent over the past 25 years. So, Ships have always played a critical role in exploring and conducting research in Antarctica. Here you can see the Royal Research Ship Discovery, which was a bark rigged auxiliary steamship built for Antarctic research and launched in 1901. The ship's captain, the famed Robert Falcon Scott, along with Ernest Shackleton, would sail her to Antarctica in 1902 and spend two years locked in the ice. Fast forward 90 years later, the ice-breaking research vessel Nathaniel B. Palmer was launched. The NBP, as we refer to her, uh, was built for the NSF in 1992 and was named after Nathaniel Brown Palmer, a uh, Connecticut sealer and the first American to see Antarctica back in November of 1820. So we're, we're coming up on the 200-year anniversary of that. The Palmer's little sister ship, for lack of a better term, uh, is the Lawrence M. Gould. Um, she was launched in 1997, and collectively, the two vessels have successfully supported U.S. and international researchers for almost 30 years. Since just the beginning of the 21st century, more than 7,000 scientists and collaborators from universities representing 48 states and more than 25 countries have sailed aboard USAP ships. And together, both ships have spent more than 12,000 days at sea in support of NSF-sponsored oceanographic research. These two vessels and the supporting fleet of small boats represent a significant part of the U.S. Antarctic program and are, are highly visible assets that clearly demonstrate U.S. leadership in the Southern Ocean. So with that intro, I'd now like it to uh, pass this to Al Hickey. Um, Al is uh, one of our most senior on-ship coordinators, and um, I always know that if he's on the ship, things can go south, but they will. He will handle them. He is a. He is a. He is my favorite. So I will <laughs> pass it to him. And let me uh, stop sharing my screen. Hello, everybody. I'm Al Hickey, and welcome. We feel appreciated here. This is a wonderful spot in Humboldt County, and I really love the weather. And in two weeks, I'll be going back to steamy, muggy Massachusetts. So really appreciate this great weather you have here. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that introduction. And thank you for all the work of uh, the Humboldt State University in supporting this conversation. I would like to have Maya bring up a PowerPoint that we put together to give you a virtual tour of the ship. And while we're waiting for that to happen, uh, the Marine Project Coordinator role, as Andrea mentioned, and Tim as well, is I function, as well as the other five people that are active in this role. We coordinate the accomplishment and the facilitation of the science mission, working very closely with the chief scientists like Dr. Wellner, the captain and the crew, as well as our science technical support staff that sails aboard the vessel. So the six of us, more or less six of us who work this, we work on both vessels and we rotate throughout both vessels uh, throughout the year. And how are we doing with that PowerPoint, Maya? 
Okay. I'll keep talking and hopefully that will pop up. As Tim mentioned, this ship was built and commissioned in 1992. So as you saw from the pictures he had, it is 28 years old. And yet you, you probably wouldn't know it. You would think it is a much younger vessel. It looks really good and there's a reason for that. We have a program of preventive maintenance to help prevent big problems from occurring. Uh, the ship's crew has a regular maintenance program as well. And then as per government and other regulatory bodies, we have to pull the vessel out of the water every couple of years to do a dry dock period where we can dig deeper into some of the other uh, bigger issues that you can't do while you're underway. Uh, there are many reasons for being attracted to this program and why we all work on the vessel. And obviously prime number one is for the mission that uh, these research search try to accomplish their work with climate and all the other disciplines within the oceanographic field. And then this is kind of a bonus here. What you're seeing in this photo is that beautiful backdrop of the snow covered mountains and the ice. This is not an unusual setting for us to be working in. Next slide, please. When the vessel was specced out, um, the NSF and the other people involved in um, designing this boat and what the needs were. They wanted a ship that could break three feet of level ice at a continuous speed of three knots and during sea trials that was indeed accomplished. And obviously it can break smaller ice at a more rapid pace and it can break larger ice at a slower pace. Um, but it has more to do with other things as well besides the thickness of the ice. You're looking at the density or hardness of the ice. You're looking at what the weather is doing. If it, is it all being pushed into a narrow bay and piling up on each other, which increases the pressure on the ice and that can make it more difficult to get out even if it's less than three feet. And over here on the right, we can just talk about the 425,000 gallons of fuel that we can carry aboard. And as you remember from Tim's couple of slides that showed these long logistics chain routes from uh, McMurdo to New Zealand Christchurch up to Port Wainimi or some of the other cruise paths that were on the other slide that he showed, we need a lot of endurance. And so by having the capacity of a great deal of fuel, we can go longer distances. We can go over 60 days, depending what we encounter along the way. Uh, that combined with the ability to flash evaporate uh, fresh water out of salt water, we can produce over 4,500 gallons of fresh water a day. So it's great to have that capacity so the scientists can be out longer, travel further and get more work accomplished. Next. That is not me, but that is the MPC office. That is Ken. You will notice as we flip through on this virtual tour, some of the spaces they are Although it's 28 years old, they, they look really good. They accomplish the job nicely. There's plenty of room. Uh, we often have meetings in here. Um, people chat to catch up and it's just a good social space as well as the work that we do dealing with email and other administrative issues. Next. So this would be a typical cabin. Most cabins are two bunks. Here you have one bunk. We have a few rooms like that. Um, but they all have a desk, they all have cupboards, they all have drawers, um, the flat screen TV you see up in the left, they can plug into the ship's intranet. In the middle there, you see a toilet, which we call a head aboard the vessel, and then off to the right is a shower. So basic, but cozy, um, great for two or three months or less. A typical cruise might be, I don't wanna say typical, but they range from maybe four weeks long to eight weeks long. Next. This is called the mess or mess deck. That's an old nautical term and it persists. Basically it's where we eat. And off to the left, which you cannot see is the galley. There are five tables. Uh, way off to the right is another table, but you can't see that either. If again, another range of how many people we might have aboard when you talk about the science party, the ship's crew and the science support staff, the technicians, we may have anywhere from 35 up to 60 plus people aboard. One thing people typically notice are the condiment trays right in the middle of those tables. 
lots of different spices, lots of different tastes aboard. We try to please as much as we can. And those are definitely secured to the top of that table because as we get into heavy seas, uh, things roll around quite a bit. And if they're not secured, they go flying. Um, so we find ourselves during the beginning orientation when everybody comes aboard that, you know, when you go to bed for the night, make sure that expensive computer or that expensive camera is not laying around on a workbench in the laboratory, make sure everything is secure. Next. This is one of many spaces on the uh, main deck where we have a lot of laboratories. This is the e-lab or electronics lab uh, situated here in the foreground, which you can't see, are where the IT people work in their space, the electronics technicians. There's a very large plotter for printing out maps from multi-beam data we may be running. There are a lot of computer workstations, so people spend a lot of time down here. They can catch up on email. Obviously, they can work on documents and work on their results and getting things typed up. Next. Dry and wet laboratories. So the one on the left is one of a few dry labs and the name speaks for itself. You don't come from the main deck into the dry lab dripping with slime and mud and dirt and everything else because on these countertops are sensitive instrumentation and equipment and science samples that we've gathered are being worked up by the scientists. So we try to keep these dry spaces dry and clean. They are environmentally controlled. There's an air conditioning ventilation system. So so things don't get too hot, they don't get too cold. And then over on the right, uh, we have the wet lab and people, a lot of these things are plug and play. You can put countertops in there, you can pull them out. Um, in this particular case, we have a counter up there. You can spread out your water sampling work. You can come in from the outside with a lot of water slushing around. You can bring in your mud core or bottom core samples with mud and everything. And that can all be rinsed off and go down the drain as opposed to a linoleum floor like you see on the left and on the right, it would be a steel deck uh, with grit uh, mixed in with the paint and a couple of large drains. Next slide. So lots of work takes place on the deck, the back deck. What do oceanographers do? They do quite a lot. And depending upon the discipline they are, are in, physical, biological, chemical, geological, they all bring different types of equipment. We do four to five day turnarounds in port between science cruises because it's a whole different group of people with different work objectives to accomplish and different equipment. So our technical staff, such as the marine technicians, work closely with the grantees and their staff to put things over the side, bring them back aboard, Board, retrieve the samples, and then they can be worked up. The thing you see on the left, the yellow ice cream cone, is a sediment sampler, and that goes over the side. It's anchored to the bottom by cable attached to an acoustic release right off the bottom, and it's strung out vertically and floats upright because we have a lot of buoyant buoys. You might see one of them, uh, not really, but there is a little flotation yellow in that middle picture. So the sediment will drop down through the water column from the surface to here. It'll be captured by this and then there's a spinning system of jars on the bottom that turn every certain amount of hours or however it's preset and then we will come and retrieve this a day, two or three later. In the middle, you see three people with white hats and there's a stand up mooring and that's called the sea pies and we deployed a bunch of those in the Drake Passage and we come back and service those every year or we did for a while. It was a five year project and basically you retrieve the data, do any repairs, uh, charge up or put in a new battery, put them back in the water and more for the next time we come around. And then in the lower right hand corner, you see a coring device. It's basically a long steel pipe, rather wide bore with a cutting edge on the bottom and a weight, heavy weight on the top, which you see in the lower right hand corner. And that is lowered over the side and dropped down within 100 feet or less of the ocean floor. And then it is tripped so that it free falls and hopefully it slams into the ocean bottom, gathers a bunch of mud, and we can bring that back aboard. And hopefully there's a good sample in there that they can take apart and uh, analyze. Next. And what do you do after all that work? You might be doing a 12 hour shift. You're probably going to be a little tired. Some people will just be on a roll and keep going. But when it is time to unwind, we have a lot of videos on um, 
hard drives that people can relax. There's a foosball table behind that you can't see. Other people may head to the gym. You may go to the sauna. Uh, you may go do email and you may just go to bed and do it all again the next day. Next. Up on the bridge, this is the O5 level. So when I was showing you all those laboratories, that was the main deck. There are five levels above that. And this is basically the top of the boat, although there is an ice tower on top of the bridge that extends upward quite a bit. And that's for when back in the day, they would go up there and you could see further out in terms of where is the ice. But here, uh, the mates and the captain have all they need to run the ship. The black chair is the captain's chair. And then you see that console in the middle and you have throttle controls for speed, forward, reverse. Um, you have an electronic navigation system on some of those flat screens. You have a depth sounder, everything you need to run the boat, uh, VHF radios to talk to people throughout the vessel. And then that long counter right behind the fire extinguisher has a lot of telecommunication equipment. Next. So that is the end. And again, there's that wonderful view we get to take advantage of. If you want to learn more about the vessel and technical specs, you can go to usap.gov and over on the left, you can go to program operations. And then from there, you can go into vessel operations. The entire website is fantastic. There's a tremendous amount of information there to just dig in and look around. So there will be Q&A at the end, and I will pass this off now to Dr. Julia Wellner. I met her at the end of January of this year. I was getting the vessel prepared for her cruise, so we had a brief chat, and I was envious of the work they were going to be doing. It's very pertinent, and I am very much looking forward to what she has to say. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Al. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And if it doesn't pop up, please, uh, someone let me know. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I really appreciate the invitation from Humboldt State and from the Schott Center. I'm sure when they invited me to do this today, they assumed I would be in Houston. And this, having moved online into a virtual seminar, being in Houston would be just fine. Coincidentally, I am in Eureka and Humboldt Bay right now, and I'd just like to say this is a beautiful community. I'm very happy to be here. It was my uh, family's choice of vacations this year, and uh, we came anyway, and we're enjoying being here. It's also great to see so many students and of my colleagues logged in on the participant list there. So as Al and before that Tim mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about the work that I and many others are doing offshore of a glacier called Thwaites. And the name of our project is Thor for Thwaites Offshore Research. I'm gonna step through a very general introduction about the project, why we work in this area of Antarctica and what we're doing there. So it's a mixture of some picture, pictures and some research, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end about either. We don't study penguins. This will be the only picture of penguins, but in any general talk, I discovered that people expect to see penguins in an Antarctic presentation. So there they are with the NSF observer watching, and uh, we'll keep going from there. Actually, through this slide in while Tim was talking, when he showed a um, image where the US Antarctic program vessels had been, and I decided to pop in my own version of that figure. Um, in red is the track lines of the Nathaniel Palmer, and in blue is the track lines of the Gould, the little sister vessel um, that only works in the Antarctic Peninsula. And in yellow is actually my personal track lines. And they are all right on top of each other through here in West Antarctica, just like many of the red ones of the Palmer track lines. But there's a reason we keep coming back to that section of West Antarctica over and over and over again. For me, that represents 12 cruises now. So approaching two years of my life, going back and forth along there. So the Palmer feels like a second home 
And it's really a great bonus that it's here in Eureka and I can show my family now. I want to point out that there are other programs that work in the Antarctic through US funding that weren't specifically mentioned by Tim. This is a slide from another project which I'm involved with um, through the International Ocean Discovery Program, or IODP, which is a drilling program. We were actually in the Amundsen Sea in 2019, and this is an international team working offshore of Antarctica on very similar projects. So there's a lot of different types of work that happen there, that most of which are directly under USAP, but not quite all of them. One picture from that year's cruise is shown here. And here is a lovely picture of an iceberg, but I draw your attention to the picture of the ship in the very back corner. The IODP cruise that I was on in 2019, um, was not on an ice-breaking vessel. It was a specialty ship for drilling, and for drilling it's a great platform, but it's not capable of breaking ice. And so this drone photo that you see with the iceberg in the foreground and the ship way off in the back is about as close as we could work. The Palmer, as you have just heard, is a very special vessel that has been designed especially to bring us close to the ice, break through the ice. And that gives us even better records of the very proximal or close to the continent records. And that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of the time here. Because for many of this, this is just not quite close enough to the ice. So the project that I'm talking about today is called THOR for Thwaites Offshore Research. I am the USPI of this project, but this is a project that's huge, and it is funded jointly by the U.S. National Science Foundation and NERC, the UK equivalent. My partner there is Rob Larder, and we have many co-investigators um, throughout the U.S. at many different universities, and also three additional members from the British Antarctic Survey and many students, both undergraduate and graduate students and a postdoc are working on this project. So I'd like to highlight really that I'm presenting the work of a very large team that we're lucky enough to work together. Thor itself is one of eight projects currently studying Thwaites Glacier. The International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, as I said, is jointly funded by the US and the UK, and it includes eight different science teams. So the one I just told you about with all of those members is called THOR, and we are studying the marine record of ice sheet history. We have partners working on land. We have other partners working in the ocean, on the ice shelf, on the ice sheet, and doing modeling. Modeling is to integrate our results and help, help make predictions about future behavior. All of our inputs are going towards um, scientific understanding, but also towards community outreach and policy. I've listed two of our websites down here where you can see the specific Thor webpage, as well as the broader ITGC webpage. And I know Elaine has been posting in the chats. If you're not watching the chat, you can check that later and she's been posting lots of supplementary information for you. So why do we do this? There are lots of different types of science happening in Antarctica. Most of what we are concerned about is to understand what if the ice was gone? What would happen if all the glaciers melted? Well, not quite what's in this picture. This is obviously a, a tabloid cartoon but it's here to remind us about what the ultimate concerns are. Understanding that the Antarctic ice sheet holds enough ice to raise global sea level about 65 meters. So about 70 meters represents the worldwide ice and about 65 meters in Antarctica. It would not look like this. It would not be a sudden tsunami racing across a city. 
What it would be instead is what you're already seeing, the day by day, millimeter by millimeter increase in sea level, the more frequent urban flooding, rainy day flooding, et cetera. So very similar to what Tim showed, about 65 meters of global sea level equivalency is in Antarctica. That's accomplished because Antarctica is about the size of US and Mexico, continental US and Mexico combined. And it's almost entirely covered by an ice sheet. I'm gonna show you two cross sections now. One, we're actually gonna do B first. So cross section B goes from the South Pole out to the East Antarctic. And then we're gonna look at A, which goes from near Thwaites Glacier over towards the area where McMurdo Station is. This area is East Antarctica, and it's divided from this side of West Antarctica by the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range. Antarctica has mountain ranges and valleys just like any other continent. It just happens to be covered by ice right now. So if we look at that cross-section B, what we can see is that near the South Pole, there's on the order of three kilometers of ice piled up over the land surface. And that thick ice sheet extends out to where we map the continental margin. And most of the ice is above sea level. This gray line on your screen represents sea level. So we see this thick, pretty uniform ice sheet covering all of East Antarctica. That's opposed to West Antarctica, where we go from A, or over near Thwaites Glacier, out to here on this side over near McMurdo Station. And what we see in the West Antarctic ice sheet is that there is still a thick ice, it still reaches a few kilometers in thickness, but much of it is actually sitting below sea level. So here is that same gray line as is on the other diagram, but here you see that much of this ice is actually resting below sea level. Remember when I showed the figure of where the Palmer has gone or where I have gone back and forth in West Antarctica, this is what we are looking at as opposed to this. There's actually a great deal of newer research. More and more people are also interested in the East Antarctic, but that's really a brand new trend. And most of our records since the Palmer has been launched, for example, has been over here in the waste, the West Antarctic ice sheet. Why are we interested in it so much? Well, ice and water go hand in hand. Ice behavior is controlled by water, we can even say. In Greenland, there's a lot of water melt and that helps sort of form rivers under the ice. Antarctica is largely too cold for that. So luckily we don't have to worry about that. But we still have two other ways that are um, water is influencing ice in Antarctica. This is a figure that we published um, in 2012 for the 20th anniversary of the Palmer. So there you can see our little sketch of the Palmer doing work in this cartoon environment. You can see the seafloor down here, ocean currents coming in. Here is the grounded ice and the floating ice. Here is the Palmer around some sea ice doing a, some type of oceanographic measurement. What we can see here is these red arrows represent warm water coming in and reaching the base of the ice. And then that helps cool the ice. The water cools down and flows out as these blue arrows in all of our cartoons. Every time we'll have a similar color scheme where red indicates some sort of warm or warming and blue indicates cold or some sort of chilling or cooling. And so the reason West Antarctica is significant in many ways is that ice is sitting in the ocean and this warm water can come in and melt the ice at the base. This is something I'm gonna bring up again in this talk when we get move to Thwaites. The other way that ice is controlled by water in Antarctica is by the presence of melt ponds. This is something that's happening farther north in the Antarctic Peninsula in places like the Larsen Ice Shelf, 
where meltwater ponds start to form on an ice shelf and then that water can percolate through. So just as a summary, the West Antarctic ice shelf has this deep base where it is sitting in contact with water. It has an ice shelf where water can percolate through and break that up. That ice shelf is buttressing the ice behind it, holding it back. Um, but if it were to be lost, then the ice could move into a runaway retreat scenario. And that's why we're interested in Thwaites. Thwaites Glacier in the Amundsen Sea is one of the major drainages of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. So here is a velocity map of how fast ice is flowing in Antarctica. Ice flows just like water does, and it flows at different speeds, just like rivers do. So what you can see here in the cool colors, this is where ice is nearly stagnant or moving very slowly. And that ice is um, representing highs or drainage divides. As that flows into areas and moves into trunks, or just like a river, it comes together, the ice speeds up. And so we can see that in West Antarctica, there are these large areas of faster flowing ice in the Ross Sea, in the Weddell Sea, and here in the Amundsen Sea, which is being fed by both Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers. This is some of the most rapidly flowing ice, but more importantly, it's rapidly changing. This is an image compiled um, through many different satellite images showing us the rate of change of ice shelves. So remember, ice shelves are that floating part of the ice where it, the ice is actually over water. Now, because that ice is already floating, it won't contribute to global sea level rise. It's already in the ocean. But it serves to buttress or hold back the ice that's behind it. And remember that we always use the same color schemes. Red represents some sort of warming or ice loss, and blue represents cooling or ice gain. The size of the circle represents the proportional amount of change. And what you can see right away is there's only a couple blue dots. There's a whole bunch of red dots. And the red dots are larger. And they're concentrated right around this area of Amundsen Sea, Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers. Those glaciers have lost or nearly lost the ice shelf that is serving to buttress and hold back the grounded ice behind them. This area where we're working has the very rapidly changing ice. And this is a compilation um, from DeCanto and Pollard of a range of models predicting sea level into the future. There's many different models, many different ways to look at how sea level might change in the future. This one's not necessarily perfect, it's just one idea. But it's representative and shows us how the ice might change in the future. What we have here is the year 2000 going out to 2100. And we have on the y-axis the estimated amount of global sea level change from Antarctica. We have a solid black line going from, 20, from the year 2000 to 2015 or so, because that's when it's based on measurements. And then as it goes out into the future, it expands wider and wider and wider. RCPs are um, part of the prediction of what greenhouse gases might look like in the future. So representative concentration pathway 2.6 is considered a relatively optimistic prediction of greenhouse gases, where RCP or representative concentration pathway 8.5 is worst case scenario, what might happen. And if we look at those three different predictions, if we just focus on the worst case scenario so we can see it most easily, there's a lot of ice that's going to melt in Antarctica. 
contribute to global sea level, flood places like Humboldt Bay. But there's also this huge range there. If you look not just at the different carbon pathways in the atmosphere, because we don't know that, but even if you look at just a single line, for example, the 8.5, which is here in red, there's this huge range between how much sea level might change. Fundamentally, what's limiting those predictions is our understanding of how the ice is behaving. Our ability to predict future sea level is limited because we don't understand what's happening now very well. So we need to keep doing that. Um, you know, I'm a professor, so I'm used to getting an hour or 90 minutes alone. So I'm gonna have to skip some of my slides to keep going quickly for you. This is a schematic um, showing the overall Thor, profess uh, Thor work scheme. So this is a cartoon showing you the ocean. Excuse me. Here is the bedrock down here. Here is the grounded ice on the right side of the screen. And here is the ice shelf buttressing and holding back that grounded ice. Here is our cartoon of the Palmer doing a range of scientific experiments. We do multi-beam imaging of the seafloor. We take temperature profiles. We take sediment samples. We do marine geophysics. And we're doing all of that to study the sedimentary record of where the ice used to be. What was the water temperature as that ice was retreating? And how was that, how fast was it? Does this ice rapidly retreat in the past or did it step back slowly? Please note, we also have colleagues working on the ice itself. And so we are doing sub ice coring and doing the same types of sediment analyses of the uh, materials we retrieve under the ice as we do out here from the ships. So we've had two cruises on the Palmer. 2019 and 2020, as well as a 1920 field season taking cores on the ice itself. A couple of pictures for you here, um, just showing our team this year in the field. Um, this is the Thor and Tarzan science parties on board the Palmer. Um, some of these great pictures this year were taken by a filmmaker who was on board with us for producing a documentary. And uh, he's flying his drone here, taking our picture on a nice, beautiful, sunny day um, with the ice around us. Here's another great picture that I love um, of the Palmer. That's actually Pine Island in back of us, not Thwaites. That's Pine Island Glacier with an iceberg that has just recently calved off. Here's a tiny little iceberg for scale and the palmer in the middle. Again, this is a drone shot and this fish hook going around us that you can see is actually the lifeboat. So this was the day of the quarterly lifeboat drills and we got a nice shot with the drone. Um, as Al said, it's always beautiful no matter what we see. Our cruise track this year is shown in pink. So we've got north at the top of the screen now. Um, down here inside the black lines, this is um, land and grounded ice. And our track line is shown in pink. I think if you are um, a fisherman or a marine geologist or marine biologist or oceanographer working in the tropical Pacific, you would look at that cruise track and say it's crazy. Um, it's certainly irregular, but we had to constantly respond to changing ice conditions. We also rescued a fishing boat midway through the cruise, and that's why we have one escape um, and then return to the area um, in the sea ice. So we've worked throughout this bay, studying both Pine Island Glacier down here and Thwaites over here. We collect multi-beam swath bathymetry data, which tells us how deep the continental shelf is up adjacent to the ice. This is one of those images with the warm colors indicating shallows and the cool colors indicating deeps. 
ice pins on shallows and flows in deeps. So understanding the bathymetry is fundamentally important, but not something that we already have. We also do a variety of types of geophysical images. In this case, I'm showing two profiles here. Um, it's not very pretty, but it's what we get on board. This is 3.5 kilohertz um, chirp or swept frequency geophysics that gives us just an image of the very shallowest sediment layers. And then we use that in order to take cores. And I'm gonna show you a couple now. Here is the Thwaites um, tongue right here, ice. In blue is our multi-beam data. And in the white dots, you can see where we took sediment cores. And I'm gonna show you how we get those and how we use them to reconstruct glacial history. So um, you saw a little bit of this in some of the previous um, talks from Al. Um, this is a jumbo piston core. Um, I like to think of it as a long, long straw. And imagine pushing a straw into a sponge cake and then pulling that straw out and looking at the different layers of the cake. That's what we do with sediment coring. The youngest sediment, like the frosting, will be on top. And then as we go down into the core, we get into older and older layers. The jumbo piston core is what we use to take as long as we can, samples that go back farther in time. We also use a device called a multi-core or mega core to take very shallow samples. And these are better at giving us the details of the surface. And then this is a casting core. It's sort of a combination of each. Here you can see we are in the dry lab that was shown in Al's talk. He said no one goes in there dirty or wet, and I'm sorry to prove that wrong in this photo. We try our best though, but mud is a dirty thing to work with. And then after we collect these various types of sediment cores, we look at the sediments and describe what we see. In this case here, you can see this core has just been opened. We are doing a variety of types of analyses in real time. Here you can see pore water is being extracted. That has to sit for a few hours. The pore water can be used to measure chemistry and isotopes of what was being deposited with the sediment. Here are more samples being taken and measured. We look at shear strength as one of the proxies for understanding the sediment. So we do as much as we can on board, but then the cores themselves are actually sent to Oregon State University in Corvallis. That is the National Core Repository, and our cores from this year are already there, um, and we will go work on them again as soon as we are allowed to. So we use these cores to reconstruct glacial history. So here is another cartoon of um, an ice sheet grounded sitting on bedrock. Here is that ice shelf, the floating ice that is buttressing the ice behind it. Here is the ocean. If we take a core that's right next to the ice, we see these very complicated, uh, coarse, gravelly, everything in there at once, hodgepodge of sediments. If we go all the way out to the open ocean, we see sediments that are dominated by phytoplankton. It's not made up mainly of sand or mud coming from the continent, but rather from things like diatoms, plankton living and dying and falling to the seafloor. And then in the middle, we get something in the middle. So if we look at some cores and reconstruct how the environment changes over time, here again, we're looking at a core that's very close to the Thwaites ice. Here, KCO4, casting core 04, was taken on a shallow or a pinning point. At the bottom, we see that very chaotic diamicton, all the different grain sizes mixed up. That represents ice. And as we move up the core, we get finer and finer grains. 
more layering, less gravel. That's indicating to us that the ice is farther away. And since our core isn't moving, that means the ice is retreating away from us. And then we get to the top, excuse me, the top, and we reach um, open marine at the, at the top of the core. There we go, okay. Seasonally open marine at the top. So what's driving retreat? Well, our colleagues who are looking not just at the sediment, but at the paleontology, the phytoplankton and the forams are looking at the details of what lived there. And what we're starting to see in our cores and cores we've taken over the last several years, my colleagues like Becky Manzoni and C.D. Hillenbrand that look at diatoms and forams are able to tell us that the water is warming. And so we can see as the ice retreats, what is driving that or connected to that anyway, is that there is warm circumpolar water reaching the base of the ice. We know that's happening throughout the peninsula and now we're able to see it in our sediment cores of past behavior farther south like this. So is that a surprise? Hmm, sort of, you know, if we get into the details, it's partially surprising. But the key for us is to understand rates. And that's why we're working on dating the retreat of the ice. Um, the ice is changing very rapidly. This is just a paper showing us uh, radar images. This is from another um, group at Stanford that shows us how the ice has retreated over time. But what I note there is that if we look at our core sites from the last two years, they are under where they have on ice radar. And what that means is that the ice has retreated enough that we can now do marine work where a few decades ago was on ice work. And that really is, you know, that's too bad the ice is retreating, but that's a fortuitous step for us because it allows us to get more detailed records and tie everything together. Um, so to wrap up here, just a couple other pictures, um, not Thor, but our colleagues on uh, the project called Tarzan work with seals and glue these ocean sensors to seals' heads. Um, this gives us an amazingly detailed record of ocean conditions. It's one of the best tools we have for understanding the ocean. It's also driven a lot of um, the news coverage of our projects. Um, because it's so interesting. Um, this year, we were lucky enough um, to get to visit a newly exposed island. Um, this is myself um, here with three others that were able to go on shore this new island. And, you know, ice is retreating, new bits of land are exposed. It's not fundamentally surprising. But it was important because it gives us new rock samples from this area in an area where there had been no land in the past. And we're now able to use these rock samples for studying the region. That also got a lot of coverage. Um, this is one of the headlines that irritated people um, more than others, um, just being co compared to a castle. Um, but it was great to have um, coverage of any type showing our work there. And we have a lot of community building associated with any of our projects. This is one of the Instagram stories that got posted showing the steps of how a core is taken, brought inside, opened, and started to be described. Um, we have school teachers that participate with us, um, media, et cetera this talk today. And with that, I'll say thank you. And with a picture from the peninsula um, taken from a helicopter, not a drone. And then I'll turn it over to the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, um, uh, to all three of you, uh, Julia, Al, and Tim. Um, uh, we can move into a question and answer session. And as we uh, noted at the beginning, please uh, type your 
questions into the Q and A uh, um, window, you can access that uh, at the bottom of your screen. And um, I will start off uh, with a um, with a question. Um, uh, this is a question uh, from the chat window. Um, uh, and I think this is a question for, for Julia. I wonder about the glaciers in Patagonia and if they're still advancing, uh, what makes them advance? Um, uh, Julia, is this something that, that you're able to address? I can take a stab at it, sure. So Patagonia um, has some really unique and interesting glaciers. I have had uh, one field season in Southern Patagonia, uh, working with the Palmer, actually. We used the Palmer in the wind, austral winter, June and July, when it was too cold for it to be working farther south. We were able to use it um, working in Tierra del Fuego and the Southern Patagonian ice sheet. So multiple things drive glacial advance or retreat. Fundamentally, it's a mass balance question. And everything I just talked about, um, when about Thwaites, we were thinking about it melting more on the bottom and doing so while precipitation, snowfall, essentially stayed the same. But of course, the other half of the equation is snowfall. And in a lot of places in Southern Patagonia, the snowfall is highly variable. And so some of overall, if we take a long-term view, the Patagonian ice sheets, all the glaciers are in retreat. That's sort of the large scale. But on the small scale, as the mass balance of the ice changes, it's because some places are getting way more snowfall just as the winds shift, and that's driving some local advances. Hopefully that helped. Thank you, and it looks... Uh, <laughs> it looked like Tim wanted to add to that as well. Or no, I don't have anything to add to that. I think Julia handled that perfectly well. Okay, great. Um, uh, I think I'm going to combine a question I had prepared with the with the next question, which is um, um, the, one question is I'm wondering uh, what the ages of the researchers uh, and there's a comment. Uh, what a fantastic presentation! Uh, and I'd like to add to that. Um, Maybe, um, Al, you could tell us a little bit about the marine technical team that you manage on board as well and what sort of training might prepare students who are interested in doing this kind of work. So maybe we could talk both about uh, um, the uh, age range of the researchers as well as um, uh, um, the, the, uh, the technical team. Sure, so it's quite a wide age range because when a PI or principal investigator comes out, they bring techs, they bring grad students, they bring postdocs, they bring colleagues, they bring senior people uh, within their departments or college or other collaborators from other schools or other countries. So I'd say, you know, you could go from 25 all the way up to retirement type age, but it does span the whole gamut. Um, to your second question, the technicians consist of, as we saw in that back deck photo with the deployment of gear, we have marine technicians, so they are working as a very skilled deck kind of position. They are fixing lots of things. They are getting things ready, and all of this is in conjunction with the other grantees, getting things ready for deployment for retrieval, uh, MacGyvering things when they have to, when things need repairs, things need modification, a better way of doing it. So they're skilled in woodwork and steel and welding, driving Zodiacs and running cranes. So that's the MTs. The MLTs are the marine laboratory technicians. So they'll work closely with the grantees within the laboratories themselves. They're helping with sample, um, manifesting and getting samples ready to be shipped off at the end of the cruise. They're working with RADs. They're helping set up some of the instrumentations in the laboratories. And then the electronic technicians kind of speaks for itself. 
And again, a lot of this equipment that comes aboard is electronic and electronics don't like salt water and they don't like being underwater in salt water. So sometimes you get intrusions or other kinds of issues. So they deal with that. And then we have our IT staff that keeps a lot of this, um, keeps the multi-beam units running, keep the emails going, keep up all the workstations. And so they function as an IT type team that you, you would find in any land-based institution. So we provide all the technical support Support and hopefully that helps the scientists get their work done better and they can focus on um, having more scientists come from within their party. I'll just add to what Al just said is that um, the Palmer and the Gould, the other vessel in the U.S. Antarctic program, have excellent support and that's one of the things that is really unique about working on these vessels is that I'm able to show up with my students and really trust that everything's going to work or if it doesn't and again it's antarctica and things are tough if it doesn't work there will be someone there who can fix it and working on smaller vessels or other waters it, it it's not as easy and um, we're really lucky to have that crew um for ages you know i said i bring undergrads once in a while um, so let's say as young as 20 for the students, but usually graduate students and most of us, you know, everyone I named as the project investigator at least has a PhD already. So, you know, we're well past school age. Can I also just jump in? Um, so, so I started out, um, I, I came up through the different ranks. I'm, I'm not a PhD scientist. Uh, I started out as a volunteer marine technician uh, when I was still in college working on research ships, uh, unpaid, um, and then worked my way up. So I, I spent a lot of time at sea, uh, learning a lot of the, the skills on the job training that, that Al was talking about. Um, and certainly having a, a scientific background is important um, to understand why you're out there and what the scientists need, um, but being able to translate that into uh, into hands-on skills uh, is an important component. So we absolutely need the, the scientists and we absolutely need the people that can MacGyver things out in the field. So. Uh, thanks so much. Um, the next uh, question, um, I'll ask a, a local interest question, which is um, what is the reason the Palmer is here in, in Humboldt Bay? So, um, good question. Uh, so, when COVID-19 began spreading around the world, uh, both of our ships were still at sea doing research uh, in the Southern Ocean. And now, as the borders started closing throughout the world, commercial air traffic uh, was grinding to a halt. We were scrambling, trying to get everybody home. Um, we were able to get both ships back to Punta Arenas, Chile, and fly everybody uh, back to the U.S. Uh, and to their respective homes. Um, however, we still had months of science samples um, from both ships, including some 12,000 pounds of core samples that uh, Julia was talking about. Um, science sample shipment is, is a absolutely critical aspect of our program. We spend millions of dollars, of taxpayer dollars, doing this research, and the samples are the raw materials of that research that the, the scientists need to then to do their uh, analyses. Um, so we need to make sure that we, we get those samples back to the institutions safely and, and securely. Uh, normally, we, we ship those through South America, uh, but again, with the commercial air traffic grinding to a halt, uh, and concerns about being able to track the, the samples um, effectively, uh, we made the decision to, to send the MVP all the way back to the U.S. Um, with the samples. Um, and just to give you a sense of how rare this is, uh, the MVP and Gould, they basically stay in South America um, in Punta Arenas. That's their home port. This is the first time this century the MB Palmer has been back to the U.S. Um, so the ship dropped all the samples off uh, in Port Wyoming, California, and then we just needed a um, safe and secure place to park the ship 
uh, for several months until uh, we need her again uh, for the next science project later this year. I'll just add to that, um, you know, our samples, I was on board, um, we were scheduled to get to Punta Arenas March 25th. So that is when um, things were shutting down. We didn't know what would happen to our samples. In many ways, because of the choices made, um, our samples got back to the US faster than they would have if they had gone through the regular shipping route. You know, this bringing them to California on the ship was a sudden change because of COVID, but it meant they got to us even earlier than if they had gone through the regular shipping in Chile. We were a few days delayed, not significantly, and our samples were actually sped up through this response. Thanks so much. Uh, we're really happy that we're a, a, a convenient parking spot uh, for uh, for the vessel. Um, uh, next question, um, uh, how deep can you core into sediment from a floating ice platform as opposed to from a floating boat platform? So that's a good question and I'm going to give two answers. The first answer is just for this year, for normal operations, normal marine work and normal sub-ice coring work. Sub-ice coring is really short. Um, you know, what we are doing, sometimes we are taking um, relatively long cores. It doesn't always work well, but we can go tens of meters from the ship. And on the sub-ice platform, really, it's about a meter, um, is about as far as it ever goes. The way that works is just um, by melting a hole in the ice and then dropping a gravity core through it. But the width of what's dropped through the ice is relatively a small hole, and so not much equipment can go through it. The second answer is both the ship and the on ice work do have some special seasons with much, much longer coring that happens. Um, the Palmer can support a drilling rig, doesn't often, it hasn't in 14 years, um, but it can support a drilling rig to take hundreds of meters of core. And the ice can also support a drilling rig rather than coring, uh, meaning it can take rotary cores, not just push cores. And when that's set up on the ice, um, again, hundreds of meters. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And I think just a, an accompanying follow up to that is um, uh, what is the age range of the samples uh, that you end up uh, collecting through those techniques? So this year, you know, the project for Thor for understanding Thwaites Glacier is really focused on short cores and very recent records. And so for the Thwaites project, what we are doing is um, radiocarbon dating, and that will get us back 10, 20, maybe 50,000 years. And that's about the extent of how far back radiocarbon works in any environment. In Antarctica, that's plenty because the last glacial maximum, the last time the ice sheet was out at its maximum position is about 20,000 years ago. So the same time that North America was largely covered by ice. Antarctica had a larger ice sheet. It's in its interglacial right now too. But what we do in my lab is um, lead to 10 dating. So we use the isotope of lead that accumulates in the ocean sediments as a way of dating. And that gets us back about a hundred years. That's it. So we do gamma ray spectrometry in my lab in Houston to understand the last hundred years of sediment records. And that's really important in a place like Thwaites because we have satellite records that go back, let's say to the seventies. And so we know what the ice has been doing since then. But we also know that the changes in greenhouse gases and a lot of other emissions started to happen around 1950. 
And so if we want to see what the changes are, what happened just before that, we need that lead to 10 record. We also, when we take the drill cores, those special years where we take the extra long cores, we go back on the order of about 35 million years. So it depends on the project. Um, thanks so much. Um, I think uh, maybe this is a question for Tim. Um, what's the biggest opportunity or challenge that you see in polar research over the coming decade? Um, well, I, I'm going to leave the science answer to that question to Julia from the from the logistics uh, side of it. Um, I say the the biggest challenge is um, access and funding. Um, I mean, it's it's an expensive effort to get down there, to get people down there, um, to have the right equipment and personnel, and um, and that's that's always the challenge. Um, particularly, uh, yeah, that's always the challenge. Um, our ships are getting older, uh, and we are. Uh, attempting to reinvest um, in our infrastructure, not only the ships, but also uh, our stations. Um, and we are doing so, but, um, but it, it's an ever-present issue. You know, um, I'll answer the logistics side before the science side, just to echo Tim's comment that a lot of the U.S. Antarctic program equipment is aging. That is one of the reasons we work in international teams so often. And one of the great things about being an Antarctic scientist rather than you know, Pacific Ocean or anywhere else is that almost everything we do scientifically is international. And that means we have many partners. And when, for example, our icebreaker may not be available, maybe a German or Korean one is. And most of what happens down there does end up having some component of international collaboration. Some people might not like that. I think it's one of the exciting parts of our work. None of our projects happen in isolation, even within the US. There are National Academy documents and other scientific planning documents that guide what um, choices for investment are made going into the future. The reason that's important is it's expensive, right? As you just heard, it's expensive to work there. This is not the type of research we can just, you know, rent a Jeep and drive out and do on a weekend. It's a multi-million dollar investment for everything we do. And that means that we have to focus on high priority science. The science that happens there not to study Antarctica, but to use Antarctica as a platform. For example, to understand uh, the solar system and to use types of telescopes that are not available to work elsewhere. That's one special thing about Antarctica. And then the other part is just understanding global change there. You know, I talked mainly about ice sheet change and that is one of the fundamental things that we need to understand for understanding future sea level. I think it's one of the easiest types of climate change to understand. You know, understanding how weather patterns change is complicated. How will farms be impacted? There's so many variables. Understanding that sea level is gonna go up, we only really need to worry about one direction of that trend. And understanding that um, is fundamentally important. And I would say the third part of the research challenges in the future are understanding how the ecosystems there are responding to warming. Um, how is krill responding to warmer temperatures? Because the krill support the fish, which supports the whales, et cetera. And how is the community responding to fishing? I told you there was a fishing boat all the way down there at Thwaites this year. You know, as the world's fishing fleet moves farther and farther south into these unregulated waters, how will the ecosystems down there respond? So that's a big challenge. Thank you. I think uh, we're almost at the end. Maybe one more question 
um, which is um, what's the most interesting or challenging time the presenters can remember uh, in their time in the Antarctic? Al? I'd say several years ago, we were working in the Ross Sea and we got a radio call from New Zealand Rescue Coordination Center telling us that there was a fishing vessel on fire from a foreign country. There were about 40 people aboard and they didn't know, you know, what the fatality level was, um, injuries, etc. And we were 16 hours away and we were the closest vessel and could we respond? And it's pretty much a legal, maritime legal thing that you do do that and you pretty much drop what you need to do and head over there as quickly as possible. This call came in at 3.30 in the morning. We had a, a package over the side, so we had to retrieve that. And then we headed over there. And also in the back of our minds, we realized that could be us. So we would really want other people to respond to us quickly if we found ourselves in the same situation. So we got there um, about eight miles out you could see billowing black clouds on the horizon. It was a clear, calm day, and that was also a very sobering, humble experience to know that was going on just over the horizon. And we got there, this white ship was pure black with smoke and char. All the windows were blown out in the deck houses. Flames were leaping out of all of them. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was a super incredibly calm day and that the sister ship had been nearby and had picked up all those people, um, I doubt anybody would have survived. Actually, three people did not make it out of their cabins on that boat. So we took the seven most badly burned people and we had a big uh, coordination effort between the New Zealand Rescue Coordination Center, our Denver office, Tim and NSF and McMurdo, and basically a lot of that going on to um, affect the good transfer of these passengers or victims basically when we got back to McMurdo. We had to have helicopters fly out to meet us because we couldn't tie up. They sent out a flight surgeon and their medical staff to help triage these people and then we got them ashore and then they were eventually taken to a specialty burn hospital in Wellington. So that was pretty much 64 continuous hours of you know being on the go um, it did have a good ending. Nobody perished as a result of it. We got the results about a month later. We made contact with some people who knew about these things. So overall, that was a good thing. We took some time out and then we got back to work. So that one sticks in my mind quite a bit. Like Tim said, things can and often do go south. So you, hopefully you're managing something that isn't too catastrophic and you hope for the best possible outcome. Yeah, I, I remember that, Al. Uh, that, that's a, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I think for me, um, so uh, like I mentioned, I, I spent a lot of time at sea, um, but I'm, I've only been part of the Antarctic program for 10 years. Um, I think one of the most memorable, uh, one of the most unique memories I've got uh, is I was on my first trip to Palmer Station. I was aboard the Gould and um, I was asleep in my bunk, it was at night, and you get used to the sounds of the ships. All of them are unique, but there's a lot of similarities from ship to ship. And I, I woke up hearing uh, a new sound, and I, 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 I pulled the curtain aside, and it was the sound of ice moving along the hull of the ship, and that was the first time I'd heard that. And I could just see these glowing white blobs of ice uh, in, the, in the pitch darkness of, of night, and um, and it it was a dream come true for me to to finally be in the ice. Um, so I, it was it's something that it's an image that has always stuck with me. Um, yeah, very special. So you know, I'm last here, and we've had two very different um, stories here, and it's hard for me to say. You know, do I want to talk about the medevac last year? where it took six and a half days till we could be met by a helicopter. And we were worried that one of our team members was not gonna make it for six and a half days. That's a problem with the Amundsen Sea is that it is so isolated, um, even compared to the Ross Sea or the peninsula, the Amundsen Sea is isolated. And there was an injury last year and we were really far away. And that's a scary part. 
but that's also why it's so exciting to work there. You know, bringing students there, I love to bring students on their first trip. Um, I very rarely have students repeat. Um, I rather share that with new students and getting to go show them something, whether it's a new island or anything else that really nobody else has ever seen. Um, it's an extraordinary experience to get to see that and for me to get to share that with new people. I feel very lucky for that career. Um, I think we're at time. So I, if we were in person, uh, I think there'd be a standing ovation at this point. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, Julia, Tim, and Al for presenting. Also, uh, Elaine and Maya for um, all of the the coordination and and uh, 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 Maya for the for the technical logistics associated with presenting the webinar and also a thank you to Mandy for the closed captioning um, uh, and a, a final thank you to uh, again to Andrea Tuttle for helping putting put us in contact and for initiating all of this. Um, the next event in the speaker series will be on September third, which will be the beginning of our fall uh, semester lineup and um, given that we're doing um, many of the activities this fall semester virtually it'll be a webinar rather than an in-person lecture and information about that is available uh, on our website at uh, shotcenter.org slash events um, and uh, again I'll just uh, close with a big thank you and uh, again welcome to our community and we're happy to be able to to play some small role in in hosting you for the 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 um, for the coming couple of months. Oh, we appreciate it very very much, um, and everything I've heard. Uh, the the ship and crew are enjoying their time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you all. all right. Thank you. Thanks okay. so much. Bye. -bye.